Act 1, Scene 7 of Macbeth is the first time we see Macbeth alone on stage. The only time he ever addresses the concept of justice and the only time he ever explicitly considers reasons against killing Duncan. It takes place against a background of hospitality because Macbeth has left the banquet in Duncan's honour to contemplate whether or not he should kill him. This heightens the sense of dramatic irony that's created by the scenes that precede it. Lady Macbeth had mentioned that the raven heralded the fatal entrance of Duncan under her battlements. Fatal in the sense of fated, but also mortal. She had also told Duncan that she and Macbeth would rest your hermits, meaning they would pray for him. But, of course, the audience knows that she had, in fact, summoned the spirits of darkness in a hellish prayer for them to help her kill him. Macbeth's opening words show that he's perhaps fully aware of the evil of the deed he's contemplating, because, for one thing, he avoids even using the word murder explicitly, as he has done throughout the play so far. His use of the pronoun it the word done and the passive voice recalls his language when he heard about Malcolm's nomination. Yet let that be which the eye fears when tis done to see. He's distancing himself from the murder through his language and we can see this throughout his long opening soliloquy here. Underlined in red are all the words, the euphemisms he uses to refer to it indirectly to avoid having to face up to what he's actually contemplating. Aside from the obvious one, which is it, the most significant is probably assassination, which is a neologism. This means it's the first recorded usage of the word. As with the other euphemisms, the language reveals a moral sleight of hand in much the same way, for example, that Hitler used the phrase extermination camps, or the word termination is sometimes used. Despite this, however, whether consciously or not, his opening words echo Christ's words to Judas, that thou doest, do quickly. Macbeth here perhaps recognises the great treachery that he is plotting against Duncan, so he's fully aware of the evil of the deed. Alongside this, he recognises how difficult it's going to be to contain its aftermath. The main image used to convey this is the metaphor of trammel. This can refer either to catching fish in a net or binding up the legs of a young colt. Both of these activities would have been fairly habitual and familiar to a Scottish lord. So it's appropriate language for the character. But it reveals the extreme difficulty he foresees in ensuring that the deed is final, i.e. done or done with, when it is done in the sense of performed. The concern is that perhaps what's done won't be done with. Lady Macbeth later says what's done is done. And of course, what the plot reveals is that this is emphatically not the case. Macbeth longs for this one blow to be the be-all and end-all. If that can be assured, then he will be willing to jump, i.e. risk, the life to come, which is heaven. The echoing of the word done around 40 times across the whole play reminds us that it's never done with. But remember that the second meaning of trammel is to bind up a horse's legs. So I've just put here in green throughout the speech how you could develop that secondary connotation and tie some of these images together. Leaping, vaulting, spur, jump and trammel are all part of an extended equine metaphor. And one way to think about how that functions in the speech is that Macbeth 
is in addition to worrying about how to restrain the aftermath of the deed, also having to restrain himself, so hold himself back. Remember, these are the three main reasons why he shouldn't go ahead with the murder. And yet, despite them, he still feels this surge of ambition. In Plato's allegory of the chariot, the human soul drives two horses, one representing reason, the other irrational appetite and passion. And that is certainly the horse that Beth is finding difficult to control here, his vaulting ambition. It's the only time that he uses the word justice in the play, but significantly, it's not because he fears divine justice or retribution. Instead, it's that he has very earthly, practical, immediate concerns. He worries that if he's successful in killing Duncan, all he'll be doing is teaching bloody instructions, which will return to plague the inventor. That means return to plague him. So it's essentially copycat crimes that he foresees in the future that concern him. Somebody might get the idea from his making a success of killing Duncan that they too could steal the crown from him. Hence the poison chalice he's about to serve to Duncan could easily be returned to his own lips. So his primary concern here, and the first reason he gives against killing Duncan, is a concern for his own political longevity. The next is perhaps more interesting and spiritually more resonant. We mentioned earlier that the opening lines of his speech are probably an allusion to Christ's words to Judas. And this theme of betrayal is what Macbeth develops in his second objection. He has a double bond of trust to Duncan. So Macbeth in Shakespeare's source material, Hollinshed's Chronicles, is Duncan's cousin, which is why he says that he's Duncan's kinsman here. He's also, of course, because Duncan is the king, his subject. Now, this gives him good reasons not to commit the deed. On top of that, though, he's Duncan's host too, because Duncan is visiting him for the banquet in his honour. So the sacred laws of hospitality also apply. Hence, he should be shutting the murderer out, not, as he's planning, bearing the knife himself. For just one of these sins, the betrayal of one's lord, Judas, Brutus and Cassius, three great historical traitors, are placed at the very centre of Dante's Inferno. This suggests that betrayal is the gravest of sins, and we can see here uh, Judas is being chewed in the mouth of Satan with Brutus and Cassius either side. This is a reminder of the gravity of the sin that Macbeth is thinking about committing. In addition to that, he gives his third reason against killing Duncan, which is that Duncan has borne his office, borne his powers as king so meekly, so gently, and been so spotless, so pure in his role as king, that his virtues, if he's killed, will plead like angels, and that the crime will be a deep damnation. In connection with the idea of virtues and meekness and purity, it's worth remembering that Duncan is described by Macduff later as being a most sainted king, and much of the imagery connected with him in the play concerns stars and growth and fertility and grace. You can see here in Trevor Nunn's 1976 production of Macbeth that Duncan is clothed resplendently in gold and white in contrast to the thanes around him in black, perhaps highlighting this spiritual aspect to his characterization. Macbeth's third objection culminates in this striking image of pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast to blow the horrid deed in every eye. What's significant here is that he says every eye presumably including his own. 
So the deed will be so horrific that the pity will be widespread enough to affect everyone. It's a spiritual outrage to kill a king like this. The imagery of tears drowning the wind, suggesting their great quantity reinforces this. And in fact, after considering his three reasons why he shouldn't kill Duncan, he bluntly states, I have no spur, so no reason, nothing pushing me on to kill him, to prick the sides of my intent, except vaulting ambition. Remember the imagery of vaulting, leaping, the spur, jumping, and the trammelled colt's legs now unbound. The vault suggests a sudden surge, and perhaps there is something irrational about the ambition here. Often Shakespeare will take the beginning of a line of iambic pentameter and invert the pattern of stresses to emphasize a particularly important word. So normally iambic pentameter has the alternation of weak and strong syllables. So if you check the first syllable of the line and find a stress, as here, for example, vaulting ambition, which contrasts with the standard I am, to prick, where it's a weak syllable, then a strong syllable. Here, vaulting, strong, then weak. It's a sign that because of the pattern we expect in Iambic pentameter has been broken, there's a reason for it. And there's a revelation of character and theme. Here, it's because of the surge of desire and energy through the vaulting ambition that's so hard for him to contain. Other examples are highlighted in blue earlier on. Pity, striding the blast, is presented as being, paradoxically, a strong figure, despite being a mere naked newborn babe. You might connect this to the power of babes elsewhere in the play. For example, Fleance, Banquo's son, who will eventually, according to the witch's prophecies, dethrone Macbeth. Bloody instructions here. Again, it's called initial inversion because the first syllable is emphasised where we expect in iambic pentameter first syllable to be weak perhaps showing Macbeth's disturbance as he envisions what he plans to do. Remember when he first thought of killing Duncan, his hair stood on end and his heart beat against his ribs and function was smothered in surmise because he was clearly disturbed by the images he had in mind. In 1.6, Duncan's naivety and ignorance was clear because he said that Macbeth's great love, sharp as his spur, hath holp him to his home before us to prepare for the banquet. But just note the repetition of spur here in 1.7, echoing that, but to ironic effect, because the spur is certainly not Macbeth's love for Duncan. Instead, it's his ambition and desire to have the crown for himself. When Lady Macbeth enters, Macbeth has a sudden change of tone. Grammatically, in fact, his final sentence is interrupted by her arrival. I have no spur to prick the size of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. It should be side, but it's missed out, because when she enters, he suddenly stops his current train of thought. And even though she's his wife puts on a slightly different face. His tone changes and expectantly he asks her what the news is. She increases the tension of the scene because she's concerned about why he's left the dining room. Perhaps she's worried Duncan might be getting suspicious. Macbeth seems to pick up on this and says, hath he asked for me? Have I been gone too long? Am I causing a scene and Lady Macbeth responds no you not he has this is boxed off in blue because it's a device called 
antilabe, which is when the iambic pentameter line of 10 syllables is shared between two characters. So, hath he asked for me? No, you not, he has. If we imagine this line placed up here, it would complete the 10 syllables of iambic pentameter. This binds the two lines together closely and heightens the sense of unity between the characters, but can also be used to show contrast and tension between them. Here, the pace of the dialogue is probably increased and we can see that Lady Macbeth is getting frustrated with Macbeth, sensing that frustration, says, we will proceed no further in this business. Now, of course, we know that the business is the plan to kill Duncan. But what's interesting is that he doesn't mention the three main objections he's just thought of. So he doesn't say we'll proceed no further because we might inspire criminal imitation because he's here in double trust and because there will be widespread outrage at the crime. Instead, he says, he hath honoured me of late and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. So this is really a fourth reason, but as Lady Macbeth recognises, it's a fairly weak one and easy for her to overcome. So the question is, <coughs> why doesn't Macbeth tell her the three very powerful objections he's just thought of? It could be because he is ashamed that she will think he's weak if he talks about his conscience, for example, telling him it's the wrong thing to do, or that Duncan has been a great king and he's bound through loyalty to him. Or perhaps it's that Macbeth really wants Lady Macbeth to talk him into it, so it gives her a reason that's quite easy for her to knock down. He withholds the strongest reasons from her, precisely because he wants her to talk him into it. This is a bit like when he sent her the letter recounting his meeting with the witches, and he missed out the fact that uh, they prophesied that Banquo's sons would be kings, and he also missed out the nomination of Malcolm. Lady Macbeth is furious at his reply, and again, the antelabe shows that the line is split between the two of them. It's as if she's briskly and brusquely interrupting him here. She picks up on his metaphor of wearing his new titles by repeating it with her own metaphor. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Dressed and worn there, work as a pair. And I think there's an element of mockery in her tone here. She's ashamed of him and says, if this is how quickly you can go back on what you promised, then such I account thy love, i.e. empty, hollow. She now proceeds to mockery, saying, are you afraid to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? This is a very powerful question for her to ask him because she's reminding him that this is his desire, this is his plan. And he would be a coward if he didn't act and didn't show through his bravery what he really wants in his heart. It's essentially saying that his single state of man is being threatened Remember, in this scene, he's torn between desire to do the deed on the one hand and a dread of the consequences on the other. So we can see him being torn apart, just as he was when he first contemplated the murder and said it shook so his single state of man. The play begins in civil war, and as we often get in tragedy, there's also a developing civil war within the soul of the protagonist too. When she compares him to the cat in the adage who wants to catch fish but is afraid to get his paws wet, it's a similar insult, a similar mockery. You're hungry, 
you want the crown, but you're not willing to do what it takes to get it because you're a coward. Her use of valour here reminds us of when we first met Macbeth on the battlefield in Act 1, Scene 2, and he was described as Valor's minion, meaning Valor's favourite or darling. So he's come a long way since then, in her eyes at least. And he was also described in that scene as being like a lion, whereas now he's a pussyfooting house cat, afraid to act. Macbeth now has heard enough and begs her to stop. Pretty. Peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. So his references to what becomes a man there shows that he senses that she is assaulting his masculinity, emasculating him, because her vision of a man is someone who will stop at nothing to fulfil his desires, certainly not pangs of conscience or worrying about widespread pity at the victim of the deed. Macbeth says that anybody who tries to overstep the moral limits of what it means to be a man ends up being not more than, so not greater than a man, but none. Lady Macbeth, again, very powerfully reminds him that it was his idea. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? This enterprise continuing the euphemisms, refers to the murder. And since Macbeth says that anybody who dares go ahead with this would be less than a man, she says, well, it must have been a beast that first broke the enterprise, so first aired it. She taunts him, saying, when you durst do it, then you were a man. And in fact... You'd be more the man. So she disagrees with him. It would be demeaning and belittling. In fact, it would aggrandise him. She doesn't understand why, when he first aired the idea, so broke the enterprise, the time and the place didn't adhere, so it didn't suit it. And yet, now that both are lined up, ready, the circumstances do suit, so they've made themselves, he is unmade. He's not ready. He won't take the opportunity. A simple way to put this is that he was all talk when it didn't seem possible. But now that the opportunity is there, waiting to be seized... She's accusing him of cowardice. This medial caesura, so midline pause, created by the full stop, perhaps creates, especially dramatically, a tense moment when she follows up her taunting of him by probably echoing desires that he's already felt and expressed to her, but expressing them more forcefully because now they're coming from an external voice rather than from within himself. She boasts in a way, again emasculating him, saying that had she sworn, as he has, to do the deed, she would have gone to the extreme lengths of plucking a breastfeeding baby from her nipple and dashing its brains out. Macbeth is essentially silenced by this because his next question is just if we should fail to which Lady Macbeth responds angrily now we fail but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail note the antelabe spread across three lines here we've got four syllables and then Four syllables again, and two syllables here, making the total of ten for iambic pentameter. This is an extremely tense moment, and it moves very quickly from Macbeth's three objections we heard earlier, the ways in which he could fail, to quite quickly accepting Lady Macbeth's vision of the future. And it's a contrast between 
the long-term outlook and the short-term. She knows that they can't fail to kill Duncan if only he screws his courage to the sticking place, which means if he goes ahead with the deed. The sticking place refers to a notch on a crossbow. So she knows as a trained soldier and an accomplished killer that there's no doubt he can kill Duncan this evening. They'll certainly not fail in that sense. But Macbeth is concerned with long-term failure and she never really overcomes those objections. He just puts them to the back of his mind against his better judgment. Remember though that although they do fail in the end, he never at any point in the play blames her. And perhaps that's admirable. It's important to note here that Lady Macbeth, despite her talk of valour and her condemnation of Macbeth's cowardice, immediately talks about killing Duncan in his sleep. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? So we're aware at this point of Macbeth's degradation, his deterioration from brave Macbeth, noble Macbeth, in Act 1, Scene 2, to the traitor killing an old man in his sleep. Just like Macbeth, Lady Macbeth is hesitant about using the word murder. She continues the euphemisms by opting for quell. It's also significant that here she talks about memory being the warder of the brain. Now later on when she's sleepwalking and is unable to escape her memories, we remember this image because she ends up as a prisoner of memory. The warder of the brain locks her in, unable to escape from her memories of the crime she's committed. Macbeth never answers her questions that conclude this speech. Instead, he implicitly assents to her vision of masculinity as, as ambition-driven, bloody action, unrestrained by conscience. In his eyes, her undaunted metal, and here we remember her prayer in Act 1, Scene 5, for the spirits to unsex her and take her milk for gall. He envisions her undaunted metal as being such that there's nothing feminine about her and that she can compose nothing but males. You might compare this to the image in Act 1, Scene 2 of Macbeth being Bellona's bridegroom, i.e. married to the goddess of war. It's as if Lady Macbeth has become that in this scene. He has one final question, which is whether they'll be easily able to frame the guards of Duncan's chamber by smearing them with blood to make it look like they have done it. She easily answers this by saying that they will put on a show of griefs and clamours to make them think that they're as shocked as everyone else, so it can't possibly have been them. After hearing this, Macbeth finishes by saying that he is settled and now will bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Corporal agent there means each part of his body and the metaphor of bending them up shows the sense of exertion and strain and in fact it's an image of him being bent like a bowstring which takes us back to the sticking place. The string is now placed on the notch of the crossbow and is ready to be released in the next scene, 2.1, which is when Duncan is killed. This might be an echo of the witch's line that the charms wound up just before they meet Macbeth in 1.3. As we saw at the beginning of this scene with the repetition of done, referring to the witches, when the hurly-burly's done, their presence is pervasive throughout Macbeth's words. Fairest here perhaps also alludes to fair is foul and foul is fair, 
from the opening scene because we've got the image of duplicity, ostensible loyalty, but underlying treachery. Hence, Macbeth says that he will present a false face to hide what the false heart knows. What he hints at here, but doesn't fully realise the power of, is that because he knows what he's about to do is wrong, and is fully and painfully aware of that, he's essentially hiding what is in his own heart, his true heart or conscience. Heilman's insight here is an important one, because it suggests that the psychomachia, which means war within the soul, is what will ultimately tear Macbeth apart. We've seen already his imagery of the eye and the hand being at war, and there's this progressive sense of self-alienation. In fact, as soon as he has murdered Duncan, he immediately regrets it and says, to know my deed, to a best not know myself. Now, in place of a curtain in between scenes, which Shakespeare didn't have, there's often a couplet. And in this case, show and know is arguably what's called a counter-semantic rhyme, which is when, although the words sound similar, their meanings are in conflict. Because showing is to do with appearance, whereas knowing is to do with the reality. So perhaps the theme of appearance versus reality, of falsehood versus truth, is encapsulated here at the conclusion of the scene. Shakespeare's writing is meant for the stage rather than the page. So let's finish by having a look at one example of how this scene can be performed. This is Trevor Nunn's 1976 production with Ian McKellen and Judy Dench. If it were done when it is done, then to well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease, success. That but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. But here. Upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. He captures the sense of a mind involved in the almost incoherent flow of its own ideas by emphasising the S sounds through assassination, consequence, surcease, success. The emphatic hope for it to be done when it is done was also clear. And there was a clear shift in tone when he said, but in these cases we still have judgment here. That we but teach bloody instruction which being taught returns to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. His stress on our own lips there shows his fear. Remember it's the first reason he gives. His instinct, above all, is for self-preservation. He's here in double trust. First, as I'm his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. His voice is faltering there because the weight of the sin, its gravity, is crushing. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast, or heaven's chariot been horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, will blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears will drown the wind. 
I have no spur to prick the side of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which all leaps itself and falls on the other. The long pause there before I have no spur suggested that he was trying to come to terms with why he still feels the way he does despite the three very strong objections he's just considered. In fact, there was an almost quizzical tone. Hannah. What news? He is almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, not he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late and I've bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest glass, not cast aside so soon. Was a hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Have it slept since? Note how her expression and her tone both harden as she chastises him for his cowardice. And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely. Ah. From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteems the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat of the adage? Pretty. Her tone seems surprised there, as if she's seeing for the first time that he's not the man she thought he was, and she really spat out coward. Peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more of a man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves. And that their fitness now does unmake you. Note how she pointed towards the banquet in the background when she said they have made themselves. She's gesturing there, saying it's here, it's within reach. Take it. I have given suck. I know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from its boneless gums and dashed the brains out. Had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail. It would fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place. And we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory the water of the brain shall be a fume and the receipt of reason a limbic only. So he immediately shakes his head and frowns when she mentions Duncan being asleep. Perhaps he feels an instinctive revulsion at killing him like that. When in swinish sleep, their drenched natures lie as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers, who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and used their very daggers? That they have done it. Who dares receive it, other, as we shall make our griefs and clamour roar upon his death? I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible fate. <gasps> Away. As she envisions the successful completion of the murder there. She seems almost elated and arguably there's a kind of sexual energy entering the scene. If he is now fulfilling her vision of masculinity, which 
she's able to persuade him with because in part it's his own then perhaps it's significant that later on in the next scene act two scene one when he returns from having killed duncan holding the bloody daggers she calls him for the only time in the play my husband because it's a an honorific term that he's now earned. A mock of the time with fairest show. Oh. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. Significantly, they end the scene embracing, reminding us of when, in his letter to her, he called her his dearest partner in greatness. Although in the next scene, she takes no part in the actual killing. So it's difficult to argue that she really is a partner in any meaningful sense of the term. When it comes to actually carrying out the deed, despite her bold claims about wielding the knife herself in Act 1, Scene 5. <laughs> 